Welcome to class 34 in topics in power electronics and distributed, distributed generation. Uh, we have been looking at uh, uh, the structure of an IGBT module and we have seen that uh, it consists of multiple layers and uh, each layer made up of different material and during uh, operation of the power module these layers heat up and cool down and uh, they expand and contract because of uh, the thermal variations and they can expand and contract to different extents uh, resulting in uh, stress between adjacent layers. And the stress can actually lead to strain or plastic deformations which can actually cause damage. And uh, we also saw that uh, different parts of the module will op operate at different temperatures, your junction temperature. Uh, would be one, your top surface temperature of the chip would be different, bottom surface temperature of the chip would be different, coming all the way to the case where which would be another value. So, there is uh, thermal gradients within the power module and uh, because of this uh, variety of reasons you have uh, uh, the build up of stress occurring within uh, the power module within uh, when it is in operation. A uh, good uh, reference to look at for uh, the thermal models and thermal evaluation of uh, the power semiconductors is an application manual of manufacturers such as uh, Semicron, ABB, OIPEC, Mitsubishi, a uh, wide range of manufacturers. Uh, they provide good, good information on how you could actually do uh, accurate uh, characterization of uh, the power semiconductor. And because of uh, the heating up and cooling down the, th uh, t uh, the temperature cycling, uh, the fatigue can cause uh, cracks in the dielectric uh, ceramic layers, uh, isolation layers. Uh, it can cause the wire bonds to uh, break, uh, form cracks, eventually break and lift off from the chip surface. Uh, it can cause fatigue in solder joints. Uh, the chip can delaminate from the substrate and uh, lift off uh, again losing electrical connection uh, impacting the power dissipation within the chip and the uh, power handling capability of the power module eventually leading to failure. Uh, these mechanisms uh, are actually uh, 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 described in the reference uh, uh, J, uh, by JDEC uh, standards and publications. So, this is a, a good standard to take a look at. Uh, we have seen that uh, uh, the, the thermal, uh, the cyclic uh, life to failure due to the thermal cycling can be modeled by the coffin manson equations and a version of that uh, was used by this group early in the mid 90s to evaluate the life and uh, the impact of uh, thermal cycling on power modules and they came up with an expression uh, uh, showing that uh, your junction temperature variation delta T j and your mean uh, junction temperature could uh, be factors which can actually affect the number of cycles to failure. So, th with that we then looked at uh, what could be the impact of uh, looking at uh, different junction temperatures, uh, T j max for your design. So, you could design with a T j max of uh, uh, 125 degrees centigrade or 135, 115. What would be the impact of doing that on your uh, uh, number of cycles to failure and the service life of your power module. And we saw that uh, we could use that as a design guideline based on your application uh, requirement. And in this particular case we are looking at a system where it was going to a full on full off condition. Uh, so, it was essentially between cycling between two temperatures, uh, but in a practical uh, application uh, we know that uh, uh, you will be operating at multiple temperatures and not just at uh, two temperatures. So, uh, uh, so you have different uh, uh, cycles to failures depending on between two temperatures your which temperature you are cycling uh, 
So you are uh, you might be operating under different stress levels, uh, sigma i, and if you have uh, n i be the number of cycles to failure for the stress condition sigma i, and small n i be the actual number of cycles that are experienced uh, in your actual application, then we looked at uh, how you could uh, evaluate the overall life based on uh, the concept of accumulation of damage. And uh, this is essentially the uh, Miner's Law, palm grin Miner's Rule for uh, uh, accumulation of damage and uh, evaluating fatigue failure under conditions of varying stress. So, we'll, uh, uh, before we go to the example, we'll, we looked at how uh, one could then uh, uh, consider conditions of varying stress. Essentially, what you're uh, doing is you're looking at longer periods of time over which uh, your semiconductor would be exposed to similar conditions of uh, loading. Uh, for example, you might have daily loading routines in an industrial environment. You might have weekly loading uh, types in transportation or uh, household uh, environment in uh, renewable energy systems, wind turbines might see a similar level of uh, wind patterns, weather patterns on may over many months or on an annual basis. So, you have periodic uh, loading conditions and then you are splitting it up into smaller cycles over the period and you are identifying the cycles to failure for each small sub period and then you accumulate the damage over the entire period and see how many such longer periods would be required for the damage, normalized damage to actually uh, become one. So, now we will look at an example where we are looking at uh, a case where your maximum junction temperature is 125, but you are varying between uh, uh, multiple tempera uh, uh, temperatures. So, uh, over an hour, uh, you, you are first going from your max uh, from 125 degrees centigrade to 65, then going back to 110, coming down to 50, then going back up to 125. So, to evaluate the number of cycles to failure, uh, you then look at this one hour duration and you have, um, uh, you could consider one cycle as going back and forth between uh, a valley to a peak back to the valley or so if you are going from only in one direction you could consider that to be half a cycle. So, in the first transition from 1 to 2 you are having a delta T of 60 degrees centigrade and the mean temperature is uh, 125 plus 65 plus uh, 273.15. So, the mean temperature is uh, 368 degrees centigrade and then using the the expression for cycles to failure uh, and the parameters that uh, were given uh, in the previous example that we considered last time, uh, we have the number of cycles to failure to be 9.61 into 10 to the power of 4 cycles to failure. And uh, in the second case, when you are going from 65 to 110, your delta Tj is 45, the mean temperature is 361 Kelvin. Uh, 110 to 50, the delta Tj is uh, is again 60, but now your mean temperature is lower 36, uh, 353 uh, and the final transition 50 to 125, your delta T is uh, 75 and your mean is 361. And for each of these conditions, we are using uh, this expression to obtain the cycles to failure. And then if you look at uh, the number of uh, the, the number of actual operational cycles under each condition uh, in a period period of 1 hour, you are you are having half a cycle in condition 1, you are having another half in condition 2 and uh, so each of this is actually each of the value of n i is 0.5. And your d i by uh, your normalized uh, damage would be 0.5 divided by the n f i. So, your 5.2 into 10 to the power of minus 6 is 0.5 divided by 9.61 into 10 to the power of 4. So, you have the normalized damage uh, 
for each of those uh, sub durations and essentially what you do is you accumulate the total normalized damage and on in one period which is essentially one hour your accumulated uh, normalized damage is 1.7 into 10 to the power of 5. So, the, uh, uh, the question is how long would this particular uh, uh, semiconductor equipment last? It would be your T rep divided by your total normalized damage during the T rep which is 1.7 into 10 to the power of and this is 5.8 7 into 10 to the power of 4 hours. So, converting from hour to years, this is about 6.7 years. So, you can get an estimate for uh, uh, what uh, the expected life would be in a more complex uh, operating cycle of your equipment. You could also then consider if you look at an actual uh, loading situation for example, in a wind turbine you might not have uh, clean transitions which you could identify it could be a uh, much more complex uh, nature of your uh, waveform of your junction temperatures as a function of time. Also you would have uh, large durations of time might be many months of data which you are actually trying to analyze. So, uh, one need to find explicit methods to actually count the number of cycles and you are looking at multiple information one is what is the delta T and also what is the average temperature or maybe the minimum temperature. You are also looking at uh, 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 w what would be the net result caused by such a variation and its impact on uh, the expected life and one way to do such counting of cycles is. Uh, uh, th there are standards for us. One is the ASTM standard uh, practices for cycle counting for fatigue analysis. Uh, one way to do a cycle counting would be to actually maybe draw a line uh, uh, through the cycle and in fact, it will not be just one line you will have multiple lines because you are also interested in the range and so when you talk about the range it is essentially the difference from the peak to the valley and not just the, uh, uh, the level at which the number of uh, cycles are being counted. So, if you could count the number of positive going uh, uh, and the negative going uh, points in your level and uh, you can see that you could for example, just count the positive going levels and for a sufficiently long uh, uh, se sequence of data uh, that would be just twice the number of uh, counts if you are doing both positive and negative uh, level crossing and you could use that information to actually look at uh, how many cycles were there. Uh, another way of looking at it would be uh, to look at where you have uh, points of inflection in the waveform where your d by d, uh, dt is going through 0. So, identifying your peaks and the valleys. Uh, often you may want to ignore extremely small cycles because we have seen that uh, uh, extremely small cycles, uh, very uh, narrow cycles uh, will not uh, cause temperature change in the or the temperature change would be in the plastic range of deformation. Also we saw that because of the thermal capacitance it is uh, not just the instantaneous loading, it is uh, uh, fil uh, filtered through the thermal time constants of your module and your heat sink. So, the waveforms would actually be much smoother than looking at it as a instantaneous power dissipation times your thermal impedance, thermal resistance of your uh, thermal model of your system. So, you could calculate your peak and the valleys and use that to actually do the cycle counting. Uh, another way is to look at the range counting. So, you look at uh, the number of uh, values where your delta T is going from one particular uh, level to the next particular level and keep counting the number of such changes all along the waveform uh, starting with the largest to the smallest. Uh, rain flow counting is another uh, range calculation where you are not just looking at uh, 
say a positive range or also including the negative range. Uh, so, for example, you might look at the uh, highest peak, the next highest peak and uh, the valley in between and you would count that as a cycle and then uh, reduce the waveform and continue with uh, the counts. So, there are a variety of ways of doing the counting. Your your statistics that you get would be slightly different because depending on the number of the way in which you are counting, but the net result can be then used for your thermal evaluation of uh, how, uh, how many cycles to failure you could expect within such a module. So, the, the net results would be uh, in the form uh, of a table essentially your table would have uh, the number of cycles, your n i, small n i which is what you are trying to count and you are looking at delta t 1, delta t 2 up to delta t k. So, delta t 1 may be cycles which are uh, 20 degrees uh, from peak to valley, delta t 2 might be cycles which are 40 degrees from peak to valley, delta t k might be cycles which are 120 degrees from peak to valley. So, essentially you are looking at the range over which the cycle is occurring and the other column is uh, your maybe the mean temperature. This particular variation whether it is occurring at a mean temperature of uh, 50 degrees or 40 degrees or whether it is at 60, 70. So, you might have T m 1, T m 2, uh, T m 3. So, at the end of the cycle counting essentially you will have uh, uh, values that are populated all along this table. And then you could evaluate the number of cycles to failure for each of those conditions, then use the minus law to accumulate damage to uh, look at what would be your actual expected lifetime of the equipment given that particular design. So, we have looked at uh, how to look at the uh, concept of accumulation of damage for uh, power semiconductor uh, uh, device uh, like a IGBT module. We could also use the concept of uh, accumulation of damage to other components say for example, you could think of uh, how it could be applied to the case of uh, in case you are making use of a capacitor because we are not operating the converter always at uh, its maximum power level. Uh, you might be operating under a mixed condition where your core temperature might be going over different cycles depending on the loading, the ambient etcetera. Uh, so, here we have an example where uh, you have a converter uh, where you are making use of capacitors where you expect a lifetime of 5000 hours. at a core temperature of uh, 95 degrees centigrade. And uh, your power converter uh, essentially operates in say an industrial environment and say your ambient temperature which is uh, uh, increasing from 50 de uh, 40 degrees centigrade to 50 at 9 o'clock in the morning and uh, it is reducing uh, to a lower level uh, at uh, uh, 9 pm. And uh, your converter is operating from, uh, from 5 am to uh, uh, 7 p m. So, you might have a, con a, a more complex operation like this and you want to see uh, what could be the expected lifetime when you are having condi conditions of varying uh, temperature, then you could use the same co concept of uh, accumulation of damage to see uh, how you could uh, uh, look at uh, the life of uh, the, the capacitor in such a more uh, in a varying operating condition. So, you could then look at 
each duration. So, look at the duration when it is operating at night, uh, at maybe at no load, at uh, when the temp ambient temperature is low at 40 degrees, at, uh, the core would be the same as the ambient temperature. So, when it starts operating, the temperature gets hotter uh, by the core gets hotter by 30 degrees uh, and at uh, once the ambient temperature also starts getting heated up uh, uh, around 9 then it goes from 70 to 80. Uh, when the power converter is shut down it comes back to say 50 and then at night it goes back to 40. So, you might have uh, operations such as this. So, you could then look at uh, the number of uh, hours a day it would be operating under each of these conditions and what would be the corresponding core temperature under these uh, different conditions. So, you are then looking at what is the life of the particular uh, device, the capacitor in this case in hours. So, we saw how you could make use of the expression that you have uh, uh, linking the core temperature to life of the capacitor. So, based on such an expression you could evaluate the number of hours at 40 degrees, the, the minimum uh, life would be at the hottest temperature. So, it is going uh, to just 1.41 into 10 to the power of 4 at 80 degrees whereas, when it at 40 degrees it is 3.54 into 10 to the power of 5. Then you could look at then what is the damage under each of these durations. So, for uh, your duration d i is essentially 8 hours, 3 hours, uh, 11 and 2 hours under these different conditions. So, your d by d uh, d f which is the life of uh, under each of those condition would be your normalized damage corresponding to one day overall period. So, you have 2.26 into 10 to the power of 5 which is essentially 8 divided by 3.54 into 10 to the power of 5. Uh, similarly, the other entries in this uh, particular last column. Then you could accumulate the damage occurring over the entire duration and that is 9.34 into 10 to the power of minus 4. Then you could look at what is the normalized uh, dam uh, this is the normalized damage that is happening on a daily basis and then you could look at what would be the number of days for this normalized damage to reach a value of 1. So, this would be uh, 1 day divided by 9.34 into 10 to the power of minus 4. So, this is 1067 days, uh, this is 2.9 years. So, if you look at uh, uh, the table, if you look at the number of uh, hours at uh, uh, 80 degrees centigrade that correspond to uh, 1.4 into 10 to the power of uh, 4 hours. So, if you look at 1.4 into 10 to the power of 4 hours, this corresponds to 1.6 years and that is just 11 hours a day. So, if you take, uh, multiply that by the percentage of time that is getting operated, you can see that most of the lifetime is getting uh, consumed at the hottest temperature which is what uh, one would uh, uh, expect in such a uh, operation of the uh, uh, equipment. Uh, 
So, we can see that uh, what we have seen so far is that uh, uh, be uh, between uh, say for, for example, you have uh, uh, in a power converter uh, between your uh, device and your uh, your uh, your uh, uh, cost, there is actually a trade off. Say for example, if you want to uh, reduce the power loss in a semiconductor device, you could use a higher current rated uh, uh, say device which would typically have a lower uh, uh, R on, the on state resistance would actually be lower. So, as to reduce your, your uh, power loss in the device, but then you would have to pay more money for essentially the higher uh, 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 cost of the higher current rated device. The other thing we saw in our examples of uh, capacitor selection, we could actually reduce your power loss in the capacitor bank. Uh, at least initially by adding more capacitors in parallel uh, when you are looking at the loss in the ESR, um, but adding more capacitors would involve more cost. So, there is actually a trade off between the cost and the power loss and we also have now seen that there is actually a trade off between the thermal analysis for reliability and essentially the power loss which is actually a function of the cost of the component. So, the reliability, power loss and cost is actually a trade off that you can actually apply in the design of the power converter. And we have seen in our analysis of uh, uh, effective initial cost that uh, we could actually now include factors of cost uh, efficiency and reliability in, uh, in a fairly straightforward manner to come up with something which uh, uh, balances uh, between the cost of the uh, component, the power loss over its operation and uh, what is the reliability that you could actually expect for the component. Uh, it is also possible to incorporate factors such as uh, weight, size, uh, power density in such a uh, effective initial cost calculation and, uh, uh, and do a overall analysis such that your uh, uh, design is actually a cost effective design. So, at this point we can we have seen that uh, uh, in a power converter we have uh, taken a look at uh, uh, two of the components. One is essentially your DC bus capacitor uh, and the power semiconductor device, the switch, the transistor and the diode. Uh, the next major component in the power converter is essentially the, the output filter and uh, we will take a closer look at uh, how uh, one could go about uh, 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 the design of uh, the output filter. And if you, uh, if you look at uh, the, the filter, it is typically uh, an inductive filter and we have seen in uh, our, our uh, analysis that in a power converter you would like to switch between a voltage source and a current source. Uh, in the power converter, the, the uh, DC bus capacitor bank is actually emulating a voltage source. So, it is trying to keep the voltage constant and stiff on the DC side. On the other side, you would uh, expect a current source and essentially the inductor plays the role of uh, the current source. Uh, we know that the inductor does not want to change the current level on uh, uh, current flowing through it. Uh, on an instantaneous basis. So, uh, essentially uh, uh, inductor can actually be used to emulate a current source. Uh, if you are also looking at uh, 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 the analysis that we have done for the current that is flowing through the DC bus capacitors etcetera, we assume that the current flowing out uh, of the I out is actually a uh, pure sinusoidal uh, current, uh, but we know practically it is not exactly going to be sinusoidal. It is going to have a ripple on it. There will be some variation above the nominal sinusoidal shape. Uh, uh, the ideally, if you want to have an ideal current source, the inductance would end up being very large. Uh, practical uh, designs would need finite uh, values the, of the inductance, which is uh, actually quite small and uh, that would now uh, add constraints on how, how large you can make the 
inductor or how small you would like to keep it in terms of uh, the design. So, uh, the first thing that uh, uh, one need to keep in mind is uh, why have a filter at all. Uh, one thing that you have is your grid is actually a sinusoidal uh, voltage coming at the input and we know that uh, the output of the power converter essentially has pulsed waveforms. If you just directly connect it essentially the current would not resemble anything close to a sinusoid. It might have uh, very large pulsed spikes which would not even work, your inverter would not be functional. So, you would definitely need a filter in a practical uh, power converter. And uh, to see why one needs a, fil a filter and what is the level of filtering that is required, uh, we have to look at uh, what are the re relevant uh, regulations on connecting a DG to the grid and the standards that uh, are associated with it. If you look at the previous uh, case, uh, if you are having a DG system, uh, say a solar system, a solar panel uh, and an inverter, the panel and the inverter would essentially be uh, within something that is being provided by the equipment manufacturer. The point at which it gets connected to the external world is at the AC terminal. So, what happens within the box is up to the designer, but what comes out of the box can actually be regulated because that affects the customer, that affects uh, all the people. So, you have regulations on how you can actually connect uh, uh, DG equipment out into the grid. And two of the relevant standards are uh, IEEE 519 and uh, IEEE 1547. IEEE 519 is about harmonics in uh, uh, power, uh, power systems and 1547 is about connecting distributed resources with the electric power systems. And the objective of these standards is to ensure uh, high power quality. So, when you are talking about uh, high power quality, uh, there are uh, a couple of uh, ways of looking at it. So, you can have uh, power quality in terms of the grid. Is when you are talking of the grid, we are looking at no uh, outage. We want voltage amplitude and frequency. is close to nominal and you can have small ranges around it and you want it to be sinusoidal which means that you do not have distortions, you do not have harmonics. Okay. Uh, you can also have power quality. So, these are uh, grid factors you can also have load side factors for the power quality. So, one thing you might uh, want is to ensure that uh, you are not drawing very high uh, reactive uh, wars. Okay. So, you may not want uh, very large surges to be consumed by the load and you do not want to have inrushes. So, those may be some concerns that you have. You have another factor, you do not want your load to be drawing harmonic currents. And uh, of course, another uh, uh, factor which would be uh, overall requirement would be that you are not uh, 
causing EMI problems because of your load that uh, is being connected. And if you look at uh, your the, the IEEE uh, 519 and 1547 uh, and the filtering requirement, you are actually addressing the harmonic issues. Uh, from the point of view of actually both uh, the, the load and the grid, okay. Because uh, if a load is drawing uh, distorted power and we know that the grid has uh, finite uh, impedances, it has finite x by r ratios. So, the harmonic current drawn by a particular load would interact with the impedance to cause harmonic voltages which would be exposed to other customers which are connected to the same line. So, you need to ensure that your currents are, uh, in, uh, are within a range such that uh, uh, one particular user will not be able to cause uh, uh, power quality problems to the neighbor. And the level of the uh, harmonic currents that are drawn depends on how stiff the grid is. For example, if the, if the grid is extremely stiff, you can draw a lot of harmonic currents and stall not distort the voltage. So, your, uh, your uh, allowance for harmonic currents can actually be quite high. Whereas, if you have a grid with uh, which is quite weak, which means that its uh, short circuit ratio is quite small, then uh, uh, even a small amount of harmonic current can actually cause a large grid voltage distortion. And when you are designing a power converter equipment, you do not know whether it is going on a, a stiff grid or on a weak grid. So, you have to design it for the worst case condition, which is the weak grid. And what is shown over here is the regulations for uh, the harmonics. Uh, the objective of the uh, overall system is to ensure that the voltage uh, harmonic distortion at the point of common coupling, PCC stands for point of common coupling and the voltage total harmonic distortion is less than 5 percent and uh, your individual harmonic amplitudes uh, do not exceed 3 percent in the voltage and the corresponding uh, harmonic currents that can be drawn by the load would then depend on what is the harmonic number and the overall objective is actually to keep your total demand distortion. We will look at the definition of what PCC is, THD, TDD etcetera is. We want to keep your total demand distortion to be uh, less than 5 percent and depending on what is the harmonic number, you have different levels of, uh, of uh, allowed currents that can actually be able to uh, injected by your DG system. So, if you look at the highest harmonic which is uh, given in the standard which correspond to the, hundred and, uh, the 35th harmonic, this would correspond to about uh, uh, 1750 hertz for a 50 hertz system. Okay. So, what uh, is being asked is when you are having harmonics at this particular frequency or higher, you can inject less than 0.3 percent of your current, uh, t, uh, current demand at the PCC as uh, harmonic currents. Often in a power converter, your switching frequencies would be uh, 2 kilohertz or higher, which means that uh, you need to attenuate your harmonic distortion to uh, less than 3 percent by your filtering action. So, uh, so this is actually an important number which comes up when you are looking at uh, filter designs for DG systems. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is uh, when you are looking at the demand distortion, you are looking at what is the demand over some time frame. Another thing is that if you are uh, harmonic is a even harmonic, it is one fourth of what is given in this particular table. Uh, even harmonics cause uh, loss of uh, half wave symmetry. Uh, so, you would like to actually keep it to a, a smaller extent. So, so the first thing is uh, to look at what the concept of uh, point of common coupling is. If you look at uh, your typical household scenario, uh, the point of common coupling is the, the place where the public service stops and where your private consumption starts. Uh, this would be uh, 
uh, in a house it, the power meter might be considered as equipment belonging to the, the distribution company uh, whereas the circuit breaker which is downstream of uh, the power meter is equipment that belongs to the uh, owner of the particular uh, enterprise. So, you are not allowed to tamper with the power meter and uh, they, uh, the, the distribution company would expect you to ensure that whatever is connected downstream of that to be protected by the owner at the owner's expense. So, uh, uh, so, the point of PCC Uh, you, uh, uh, you can think of uh, uh, analogy between uh, the electrical system and, uh, uh, and say your uh, physical uh, uh, say home and the roads that come to your home. So, an uh, interface between your home and the road would be your gate. So, uh, beyond the gate is the public road, inside the gate is your private home and essentially the objective uh, is uh, in that particular case might be uh, you might have uh, you might be uh, coming in and out of your house, but you might also be generating some garbage in your house which you have to dispose of. Uh, so, you can think of harmonics as pollution which you do not want ideally it should be 0, but you know that if you want to have a complete uh, garbage disposal facility in each and every house it might be too expensive. So, you are allowed to dispose of some amount of garbage, but uh, if it is too large instead of maybe a bucket full of garbage you are disposing a truck full of dab, uh, garbage that is not acceptable. Okay? But whether the garbage is being generated by uh, your elder brother or whether it is someone else in your family it does not matter, uh, the total should not be too large. So, that is essentially what is being seen at the PCC. Uh, and the concern is if you have too much garbage your neighbors would not like it, you might uh, cause health problems in the neighborhood. So, you want to ensure that the park your quality of uh, life overall is good. So, essentially you can think about harmonics in power systems as a societal requirement. It is important that you meet the standards that ensure that the power system operates in a clean manner. So, we the other uh, 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 concept that we had mentioned is about uh, uh, THD, THD is essentially the ra ratio of your RMS of your ha harmonic components from the second to the largest value that you would have or would consider in your particular application divided by the RMS of your fundamental and commonly in the, in the IEEE in con context. Uh, we look at the voltage specification of the PCC in terms of VTHD because the VTHD at the PCC is uh, going to be similar uh, same as the VTHD at all the loads within that particular facility because your uh, IR drops in the uh, conductors within your particular establishment is not going to be very large. So, irrespective of whether it is a load or at the PCC you would see similar levels of uh, THD in, uh, in your system. Uh, whereas, that is not the case of uh, uh, your current. Say for example, you might have a current which is uh, highly distorted from one equipment, but your current drawn by the other equipment might be clean and sinusoidal. So, when you are looking at the PCC overall you might not have much distortion just because you have other loads within the particular facility. So, what is being asked is that the overall demand uh, based on the demand seen at the PCC, uh, your, your uh, value of the distortion, the ratio of your current harmonics from the second to the highest that is being considered divided by the RMS value of your demand is not exceeding a value and the demand might be considered over a 15 minute or a half an hour duration and you want to ensure that uh, it meets the particular standard. Uh, in uh, a DGA uh, application, uh, it may not just be uh, uh, 
your your actual uh, uh, demand might actually go up and down depending on what other loads are there in the system. A uh, worst case might be to consider your DG source as the only source in which case you are looking at uh, what is the, uh, the, the distortion divided by what is the fundamental being output from your DG source and because uh, one might be interested in what is the maximum uh, operating point of this particular equipment, you might also be looking at what is the rating, uh, uh, rated conditions under which such a, a system might uh, operate and that is where you have your TRD, your total rated distortion. rather than looking at uh, the demanded distor uh, demand distortion over 15 minute or 13 min minute intervals. Uh, so, uh, so, what we have uh, done is so far we have looked at uh, 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 the AC side current to be a smooth sinusoid. Uh, so, the next thing that we could do is uh, maybe uh, look at what would be the ripple that would be coming out of uh, say a power converter connected to the grid with a DC bus voltage and the grid side voltage uh, in case of a simple uh, topology such as the single phase center uh, tap topology. So, for that what we will look at is uh, look at the modulating waveforms and look at what is a ripple current uh, depending on what the duty cycle is. So, if you look at your actual current, uh, your modulation signal that is being provided to the switch that, my, that is shown as D over here and your uh, you have your triangle triangles which is your carrier and you compare your D modulation uh, uh, du uh, your duty cycle command with your carrier to actually look at what your modulation signals to the gates are. So, when S plus is on the top switch is, uh, is on you are applying plus V D C by 2 across uh, uh, at the output of your, uh, your converter leg and on the grid side you have v, v grid. One thing that we will assume is that the grid voltage is close to your uh, output voltage of your leg. So, we will assume So, uh, so if you are uh, uh, another thing that we would assume is that your duty cycle is not changing by much. So, it is uh, whatever you are commanding is uh, close to being constant over a duty cycle. So, you are assuming that your uh, switching frequency is high. You are also assuming if your grid voltage is close to the voltage that you are commanding it means that the voltage drop across the filter inductor is quite small. Okay. So, this, this would be the fundamental voltage drop in the inductor would be small if uh, L is small, if the filter inductor itself is small or if your uh, loading condition of your power converter is slight. or it could be a condition of both. So, we could write an expression then for what is the, the current that is flowing through the filter inductor during your on duration and off duration. So, during T on uh, 
essentially your S plus is on, we have V D C by 2 minus your grid voltage which is taken as V D C into D minus 0.5 is L into delta I out change in the value of your output current divided by T on. Uh, similarly, during the off duration, we have minus V D C by 2 being applied at the output and your grid voltage is and the ripple is now uh, going down. So, you have L minus delta I out by T off. Also, we know that T on plus T off is your switching duration. which is essentially the reciprocal of your switching frequency. So, you can write an expression uh, for uh, T on plus T off in terms of these two expressions over here. You have 1 by F S W to be equal to uh, L delta I out by V D C So, you could then write an expression for what your current ripple is. You have delta I out is V d c into d into 1 minus d. So, one can uh, see from this expression that uh, uh, you have if you have a higher V D C one is uh, if uh, V D C is high then essentially your delta I out would be high. So, so you do not want to keep your D C bus voltage to be too high uh, for multiple reasons one is you do not want to stress out your components the other thing is you want to keep your ripple to be not too large. Uh, if your F S W is high, then your ripple would come down, uh, but with a higher switching frequency we will end up with higher switching losses in your uh, semiconductor components. The third thing would be if your value of inductance is high, then your delta I out would be low which is natural to expect. The other thing to see is that if you look at this particular expression, uh, it is d into 1 minus d. You can uh, look at when you have minimum or maximum conditions of your ripple, you will get a maximum ripple for this uh, single phase inverter. It occurs when uh, when d is equal to 0 0.5. So, essentially this is when your output voltage is 0, you will end up with higher ripple. Uh, you are going to have minimum ripple when d is equal to 0 or uh, 1. So, when d is equal to 0 or 1, this turns out to be 0. So, you will not have ripple. So, under uh, the close to the peak or value of your voltage reference, you will end up with smaller ripple in the single phase power converter. Uh, we will uh, look at some of the constraints when you look at uh, your selection of the inverter. Uh, the selection of the inverter, selection of the uh, L. So, one thing you would like to do is you want to attenuate the selection of L to satisfy one is ripple attenuation. 
for which you need L to be large, you would also like to keep your fundamental voltage drop across the filter low. Of which you would like to keep your inductance low. Uh, to uh, keep your DC bus voltage uh, low, you would like your inductance again to be low. If you look at it from a dynamic response perspective, you would like uh, a larger inductor has more, uh, you can think of it as having more inertia. So, you would like to keep your value of your inductance low from your dynamic response perspective. Uh, whereas, if you are looking at it from surge transients, so you turn on the converter and you want to limit your surge current, you would like to then have a higher impedance so, you would like your uh, inductance to be high. If you look at uh, the power loss, it has to be, in, if it is too low, then the ripple current would cause a lot of losses. If it is too high, your fundamental current loss would be too high. You are looking at some optimum value of L, which is lying in between. So, you have multiple constraints that come up when you are, uh, you are looking at selection of uh, inductor. So, we will look at uh, a starting point of how you could uh, uh, start with the design of a simple uh, inductive filter in the next class.